day everyone. In this video, we will discuss about the step-by-step -step process in graphing polynomial function. I'm gonna share with you strategies for graphing polynomial function. So we are going to follow six steps for us to be able to graph a polynomial function. We have step number one, use the car to loop sign to determine the possible combination of zeros. Step number two, we have to use synthetic division to determine the zeros of the function. Step number three, we have to look for the y-intercept by solving for f of zero, meaning here the value of x is equal to zero. Step number four, we have to identify the extreme bounds of the graph, meaning we will be identifying the lower and the upper bound of the zeros of the polynomial function. Step number five is we have to determine the graphs and behavior so it's important that we know how the graph behaves and for the last step or step number six after gathering all the points we will use these points obtained in the above steps as key points in sketching the graph let's now begin with step number one let us discuss step number one with the given polynomial function we will be using the car tool of sign to determine the possible combinations of zeros before we do that Let's identify first the total number of zeros or roots for this polynomial function. So as you can see here, the highest exponent is 3, meaning the degree of this function is on its third degree. And by the way, you call this function a cubic function. So that only means that the total number of zeros is equal to 3. Now let's go identify how many were positive zeros here, how many were negative, and do we have imaginary or zero roots for this polynomial function? So to identify the number of positive zeros, we will just count the number of variations of p of x. So let's identify the sign of each term. We have here 2x cubed, the sign here is positive. Minus x squared, the sign is negative. Minus 13x, the sign is negative. And then minus 6, the sign is negative. So, when we say variations in sign, that means there is a successive opposite sign, and we will be counting that one. So, as you can see here, we have positive and a negative, that's one variation. Next to that is we have negative and a negative, no variation. And then negative and a negative, no variation also. We only have one positive zero or one positive roots in this polynomial function. And let's identify now the number of negative zeros by substituting negative x to the original polynomial function. So that means we will just count the number of variations in p of negative x. So don't forget to simplify our polynomial function here. So looking at the simplified one, we have the sign of negative 2x cubed that is negative, minus x squared is negative, plus 13x is positive, minus 6 is negative. Now let's count the number of variations here. So negative and negative, no variation. We have the next one, negative and then positive, one variation. And then positive and then negative, we have another variation. So that only means we have two negative zeros or negative roots. Now, because the total of positive and negative zeros here is already equal to 3, and that only means we have no imaginary or zero roots for the first combination. Now that we're done identifying the combination of zeros of our polynomial function, let us proceed to step number 2. So in step number 2, we will use synthetic division to determine the zeros of the function. So given this polynomial function, let us write the numerical coefficients of this as our dividend. But before you do that, take note that the polynomial function must be arranged in decreasing power of x and there must be no missing term. So let's write here positive 2, negative 1, negative 13, and then negative 6. For our synthetic divisor, we will be listing all the possible rational zeros in the form of p over q. So take note here that p is the value of the constant term and q is the value of the leading coefficient. So we have here 6 over 2. And then let us list all the factors of 6 and 2. We have that one and then we simplify that one. We have p over q is equal to positive and negative 1, positive and negative 2, positive and negative 3, positive and negative 6, positive and negative 1 half, 
and positive and negative 3 halves. So we will be using this as our synthetic divisor. Take note that out of 16 possible rational zeros, there were 3 roots here or 3 zeros of the function. Let's try if positive 2 is a zero of the function. This will become the zero of the polynomial function if and only if the remainder is equal to zero. So let's proceed to synthetic division. We will be using multiplication and addition here repeatedly. First thing is first you have to bring down the leading coefficient which is 2 and then proceed to the two operations. So 2 times 2 is equal to 4. 4 plus negative 1 is equal to positive 3. Positive 3 times 2 is equal to 6. 6 plus negative 13 is equal to negative 7. Negative 7 times 2 is equal to negative 14. Negative 14 plus negative 6 is equal to negative 20. Notice that our remainder here is not equal to 0, meaning 2 is not one of the zeros of our polynomial function. Let's try another 0. So let we have here negative 2. So let's bring down 2 here and then 2 times negative 2 is equal to negative 4. Negative 4 plus negative 1 is equal to negative 5. Negative 5 times negative 2 is equal to positive 10. Positive 10 plus negative 13 is equal to negative 3. Negative 3 times negative 2 is equal to positive 6. Positive 6 plus negative 6 is equal to 0. Our remainder here is 0. Therefore, negative 2 is a 0 of the function. Take note that according to the card rule of sign, we will be looking for 2 negative zeros and 1 positive zeros. So let's try another negative 0 here. We have here negative 1 half. Bring down 2 and then multiply 2 times negative 1 half. We have negative 1. Negative 1 plus negative 1 is equal to negative 2. And then negative 2 times negative 1 half is equal to positive 1. Positive 1 plus negative 13 is equal to negative 12. Negative 12 times negative 1 half is equal to positive 6. Positive 6 plus negative 6 is equal to 0. Our remainder is 0. Therefore, negative 1 half is a 0 of the function. Now that we have already two zeros here, let's try positive values of x as our synthetic divisor. So we have here positive 3. Bring down 2. And then let's multiply 2 times 3 is equal to positive 6. Positive 6 plus negative 1 is equal to positive 5. 5 times 3 is equal to 15. 15 plus negative 13 is equal to positive 2. Positive 2 times 3 is equal to 6. Positive 6 plus negative 6 is equal to 0. Therefore, 3 is a 0 of the function. Now that we have gathered already the zeros of our polynomial function, this only means that the zeros of our functions are negative 2, negative 1 half, and then positive 3. Now that we have all the zeros of our polynomial function, we can now proceed to step number 3. For step number 3, we have to look for the y-intercept by solving for f of 0. So when we say y-intercept, this is the value of y when x is equal to 0. So given this polynomial function, we will just solve for f of 0, and that is to substitute the value of x which is 0. And then we simplify this one, we'll have p of 0 is equal to negative 6, meaning negative 6 is the y-intercept. So in step number 4, we will identify the extreme bounds of the graph by using the bounds of the zeros theorem. So when we talk about extreme bounds, these are actually the lower and the upper bounds of the zeros of our polynomial function. And that only means we will be using the zeros of our polynomial function as the basis in identifying the lower and the upper bound. So let's do this one. Copy first the coefficients of our dividend here. We have positive 2, negative 1, negative 13, and then negative 6. Take note that for us to be able to find the lower bound of our polynomial function, there is a condition that the entries must be alternately positive and then negative. Let us look at the smallest zero integer here, and that is negative 2. So think of the number smaller than negative 2, or a number next to negative 2 which is smaller than negative 2. We have negative 3. So let's try if negative 3 is the lower bound. This will be the lower bound of our polynomial function if and only if the entries of the quotient here 
will be alternately positive and then negative. So let's do synthetic division here. Bring down 2 and then let's multiply 2 times negative 3 is equal to negative 6 plus negative 1 is equal to negative 7. Negative 7 times negative 3 is equal to positive 21. Positive 21 plus negative 13 is equal to positive 8. Positive 8 times negative 3 is equal to negative 24. Negative 24 plus negative 6 is equal to negative 30. Notice that the entries here are alternately positive and then negative. And that only means negative 3 is the lower bound of our polynomial function. Now let's go to the upper bound. So the condition for upper bound, all the entries must be greater than or equal to zero. So let us look at the largest zero integer here and that is positive three. So let's pick a number next to positive three and that is positive four. So let's see if this will be the upper bound of our polynomial function. So let's bring down two here and then we multiply two times four is equal to eight. 8 plus negative 1 is equal to positive 7. 7 times 4 is equal to 28. 28 plus negative 13 is equal to positive 15. 15 times 4 is equal to 60. 60 plus negative 6 is equal to 54. Notice that our entries here are all greater than 0. So that only means this is the upper bound of the zeros of our polynomial function. So we are now in step number 5. Determine the graphs and behavior. So to determine the behavior of the graph, we will just look at the leading coefficient and the power of this polynomial function. So the value of n here or the power is equal to 3 and that is an odd number. And the value of the leading coefficient is equal to 2 which is greater than 0. And according to leading coefficient test, if n is odd and the leading coefficient is greater than 0, then the graph falls to the left and rises to the right. So that would be the behavior of our graph. Let's proceed to step number 6. We will gather all the points obtained in the above steps as key points in sketching the graph. So that only means that we will identify the values of x with the values of y. So first, we have the zeros of our polynomial function. Take note, these are the values of x that makes our polynomial function 0. And p of x is actually the y values. Okay? So let's write here the values of x. We have negative 2, the value of y is 0. Next, we have negative 1 half, the value of y is 0. And then next is 3, and the value of y is also 0. Next is the y-intercept. So for the y-intercept, take note that the value of x here is 0 and then the value of y is negative 6. So let's write here 0 and then the value of y which is negative 6. The last one is the bounds of the zeros theorem. These are the upper and the lower bound. So take note, these are the values of x. The values of y are negative 30 and then 54. So we will write that as our x and y. We have negative 3 here and the value of y is negative 30 and then positive 4 and then the value of y is positive 54. Now that we have the key points of our polynomial function, we will plot these points. We are now ready to plot the points of the graph. Let's copy first the table for our x and y coordinates. And this is the space where we are going to plot the points. So we have here the values of x and then the values of y. Notice that the intervals in our y-axis is actually greater than the intervals in the x-axis. It is because we don't have enough space for us to have one interval only in the, on the y-axis. So it is okay as long as they have equal intervals. So let us plot the first point. We have negative 3 and then negative 30. It's actually located on the fourth quadrant. We have here negative 3 and then negative 30. 
Next point is one of the zeros of our function. We have negative 2 and then 0. The value of x is negative 2 and the value of y is 0. So our point lies on the x-axis. It's here. Negative 2 and then 0. Next, we have negative 1 half and then 0. Negative 1 half is actually in between 0 and the negative 1. And the value of y is 0. So that only means the point lies on the x-axis. It's here. Negative 1 half and 0. Next point, we have 0 and then negative 6. This is the y-intercept. The value of x is 0 and the value of y is negative 6. And that only means our point lies on the y-axis. Next, we have 3 and then 0. So, the value of x is equal to 3 and the value of y is 0. So, our point lies on the x-axis. So, 3 and 0 here. Last point is the upper bound and that is positive 4 and then 54. It's actually located on the second quadrant we have here. The value of x which is 4 and the value of y is 54. So it's here. Now we are ready to trace the points of our graph. But take note of the end behavior of this graph. It must fall to the left and it must rise to the right. So we have here from the lower bound, we will trace it all the zeros. Take note that our zeros of our function are the turning points of our graph. So we will trace from the lower bound and we will rise to the upper bound. So we have here negative 3 from negative 3 and negative 30. Let's trace that points. There we have the graph of our polynomial function. That's all for today. Thank you for watching. I hope you learned something. If you haven't subscribed yet to this channel, don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell button to update you on my next videos.